Thanks to everybody. It's a great pleasure to be uh, on this panel. It's a, you know, I regret that I'm not out there. Um, I've done a number of these plenary sessions panels over the years, and it's always been a tremendous uh, exercise in, in uh, both reality and uh, and shaping. And I really appreciate that. And there's nothing like having a new grandson to make you realize the long term importance of national security, not only to us in America, but to, but the, to the world. And so uh, we appreciate that as well. So we have a, a general principle this afternoon. Our, our topic is, or this morning, it's afternoon for me, it's morning for you guys. So um, uh, on the, the uh, essentially the, the need for recapitalization and surge capacity, uh, the implications for the defense acquisition system. When we proposed this panel topic, we were only a few months into the war in Ukraine. We're now 15 months in, and uh, I would say that we have a clearer idea of the past than we did uh, when we proposed this. I'm not quite sure we have a clearer idea of the future uh, than we did when we proposed this. I've got a great panel here today with me. Here's kind of the way we're going to run it. I have a few opening remarks, uh, then I'm going to turn to something that's been a, long been a feature of these plenary uh, uh, panels, which is a, a summary of some important contract data uh, over the past year, particularly looking at FY22 and early FY23. Uh, done by the Center for Strategic International Studies. It's about an eight-minute presentation. It'll set the stage very nicely for the conversation we're going to have. Uh, and then I'll go through the panel members, uh, and I'll, I'll just go through them one by one uh, and ask them to tackle the question that I'm about to lay out before the slideshow. Then we'll open it up to the audience. And uh, uh, Bob, I know that uh, you probably had way more questions than you had time to get to from Dr. LaPlante. You don't need to recycle those you didn't get to, but I suspect that they're, uh, almost many of them are equally relevant to us going forward here. So. Um, so let me start by kind of setting the stage a bit. There's general agreement that we've got the problem statement is pretty easy to solve when it comes to recapitalization and, and surge capacity. Um, we basically have production that doesn't match consumption right now. And uh, and that's a, a very real problem. I call it the replacement gap, but there's a lot of other issues that could come up as well. There's not any doubt about that. You know, Ukraine is firing as much as we and others can get to them. Um, sometimes uh, a full year's worth of, uh, of production in a month or two, right? And and we know in the history of warfare, um, especially uh, at this scale and intensity and duration, um, the military typically doesn't run out of targets until it starts to run out of munitions or platforms. And, and that's kind of the history of warfare back for quite some time. Um, but where there's less agreement is why. And what do we do about it, right? So some have written, uh, perhaps drawing incorrectly from DOD's own analysis and reports, uh, that industry is too consolidated, there's not enough competition, and the surge capacity has deteriorated as a result of those two uh, dynamics. Uh, some say DOD requirements are incomplete or insufficient or underfunded or maybe for the wrong war. Um, some say that industry is just not interested in surge capacity. That's uh, you know that's building old stuff. Who needs 2004 javelins uh, uh, back in the inventory, right? Um, some note elements such as uh, you know worker shortfalls, um, problems with raw materials and components, long lead times uh, exacerbated by COVID and other things, etc. Uh, that's uh, uh, the theory. Some may apply here, right? Uh, some say the investor community is just sees greater profits uh, somewhere else. And so, you know, when the return on a treasury bill is actually higher than the fee that uh, contractors are collecting on a number of their contracts, especially in the logistics and sustainment side, uh, maybe they have a point, right? Uh, there's a lot of other reasons that are posed by experts and practitioners and politicians uh, who's right, or maybe they're all right in some way, you know. But more important than that, I mean, I do think that you can't actually develop good solutions until you've got pretty strong agreement on the problem statement. But there is a lot we can do to talk about, okay, what do we do about it? So we've got uh, a great panel here to explore that with us today. Uh, I'm just going to highlight them all on the stage there in, uh, uh, in in the Monterey Bay area. You have Cynthia Cook, uh, now of the Center for Strategic International Studies, along with Rand, great colleague over the years on many of these issues. Uh, and you have Bill Greenwald, who is uh, 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 Bill's from a lot of backgrounds, actually. I think I'll characterize you, Bill, today um, as a, uh, a, a former Hill staffer because you're responsible for some of the legislation that's caused these problems in the first place. Uh, we'll come back to that at the uh, at the end of the stage. Then joining me on the virtual screen in the Hollywood Square section, um, I have Christine uh, McKenzie, who is the Senior Technology Advisor to Dr. Bill LaPlante, the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. And I have joining us from the Army, uh, Matt Zimmerman, who I believe, Matt, your, your title is the Acting Deputy uh, of the Joint PEO for Armaments and Ammunitions. 
And uh, and he's joined by Colonel Tony Gibbs, who's a recent recent escapee from that uh, joint PEO and is now uh, at PEO Soldier. Uh, but I think all your problems have gone with you, Tony, and uh, and the solution set uh, is it draws from the same dynamics as uh, as it did in, in armaments and ammunition. It's just a little bit different. So that's kind of the layout, if you want, if you will. Um, I want to first then uh, you know remind you that this is something we do each year in this plenary session panel. I'm going to invite to the to the platform here, uh, Greg Sanders. Greg has a short series of slides, and each slide sort of draws from the data that shows where DOD has been spending its money on contracts over the past year and two, both pre-Ukraine and post-Ukraine. But more importantly, drawing some lessons from some of this data that I think will help set the stage for the conversation we have. So, Greg, I see you at the microphone, and uh, I believe we're ready to test the capability and bring the slides up as well as your voice up. So I'll turn the microphone over to you and ask you to stick to a short, quick timetable and we'll get your lessons learned and get on with it. Thanks. Thank you, David. So as you mentioned, this presentation will look at contracting and OTA trends. It includes fiscal year 2022. And we also took a selective look at the first quarter fiscal year 23. Uh, so I think we all know what some of the key topics are, so I won't rehash that. But I would like to thank my colleagues, Alexander Hordenis, Cynthia Cook, and Nicholas Velasquez for help in assisting uh, in maintaining this data and analyzing it. So top line, four points. First, contract spending is broadly keeping up with inflation. Um, but the second point is that by fiscal year 2022, supply in Ukraine had not yet really refocused and shifted the priorities as seen in that contract spending. Um, nor similarly have the recapitalization or Taiwan you know, preparation efforts shifted from what had previously been planned. By fiscal year uh, 23, quarter one, that Spain has begun to arrive. And it's important to emphasize the things that are not covered in this contracting data. And I'll touch on that, and our experts can speak to it more. And then fourth, as Dr. LaPlante mentioned, uh, the DOD response to COVID-19 using pre-existing investments and tools did show that rapid contracting can be possible, but these tools have also proven less applicable thus far to the search capacity and recapitalization issues. So briefly, we're drawing from a federal procurement data system. Acquisition trends in part are a way to overcome some of the challenges of that system. You know, there are, incomplete reportings, there are gaps, there are summary assumptions, but the year-on-year -year can still tell us a great deal. Classified contracting, like wise is not included. So looking at the overall top-line spend, it was 414 billion in fiscal year 2022. So it's a 0.1% increase after accounting for 7% inflation as reported by OMB. It can actually be a little better than that potentially if you look at OMB's defense outlay um, deflators, which says it's about 5% growth, but I think the more conservative is useful for this purpose. So if you look at product spend uh, services and R&D, products were up about 1% to 209 billion, which does reflect a little bit of that shift to production, but perhaps not as much as you might think. Research and development has seen seven years of real growth but services contracting is down. So the product spend was highest, about the same level as 2018. The surge in 2020 was driven by lumpy contracting and definitization for the uh, F-35 rather than a clear shift in priorities. So overall products are up, but only a bit. And in FY23 quarter one, things are moving in the same direction for all three. So Army, Navy, and Air Force are all down a smidge. Army has actually fell 4% to 113 billion, and it's especially worthy of our attention for this question because they have a lot of the orange missiles and other responsibilities that relate to the war in Ukraine and recapitalization. But the Army figure is deceptive because as you know, Dr. Bland mentioned, they have been having lead on a variety of COVID response and that actually can account for about a quarter of their spending, um, including 24, 32 billion in FY21 on drugs and biologicals, 24 billion in 22, 
and 4.6 billion in 22 on medical and surgical instruments. The big winner last year was actually DLA, up 15%. So turning to platform portfolios, here is actually our most surprising result. The ordinance and missile spending was down in fiscal year 2022. Um, it fell to 20.5 billion, a 13% decline. And much of that can be attributed to the guided uh, missile category. So that fell from 6.6 .6 billion to 5.1. Some of this is just lumpy contracts as with F-35, specifically for the Trident system. But surprisingly to me, um, the, guided missile, the guided multiple launch rocket system, Gimler's, dropped from 1.8 billion to 1.1. And that has been a pretty, I'm sorry, 1.3. And that has been an area of focus for the Ukraine response. Some other areas are up, space up uh, 18%, air and missile defense, which is also a very relevant category, rose 7% to 15 billion. And we're going to return to these categories to see that somewhat due to the time it takes to work things through an acquisition system, quarter one of FY23 is just a slightly different story. So Dr. LePlan also mentioned OTA as a key mechanism. So OTAs did prove their warp for this rapid support of Operation Warp Speed. So about half that spending in FY20 is going directly to COVID-19 response. And similarly, 21, it's a major portion of response that's showing up in other knowledge base and right graph. However, for the response to the war in Ukraine, OTAs have not been as relevant thus far. Part of this is you can see that the services and product sides of OTAs is still quite small in 2022, even though there's some growth through 21. And on the right, you can see that ordnance and missiles, a traditional strength of the mechanism, actually are down a little bit in 2022. So I think one thing to watch is how this mechanism might be potentially used for future and to study how it was part of a rapid effective response to COVID. Likewise, commercial contracting has been a major part of response for COVID. You know, that green bar you can see creeping up for Army is part of their response there. And so right now, 26% of DOD contracting is using some sort of commercial mechanism. But again, this is less relevant to recapitalization and the response to Ukraine and potential um, deterrence for a scenario in Taiwan. Multi-year contracting. As Dr. LePlant mentioned, you know, the new authorizations did come through in 2022, but that's not going to show in this data yet. So previously, we had seen a buildup in air and missile defense on multi-year, which is a powerful signal industry. And we should see a great buildup in FY23, potentially as high as perhaps 15% based on these other portfolios, which would almost double the current 8% level of foreign and missiles, even if only some of those 17 authorized systems are used. So now turning into the promised first quarter of fiscal year 23. So if you look at, um, at the ordinance and missiles category, relatively small, but you can see that orange bar is bigger than many of the past years. So versus first quarter of fiscal year 2022, Ordnance and missile spending is up 54%. So some of that money that uh, Dr. Van mentioned in his presentation is starting to arrive, and that demand signal is starting to be there for industry, though it did take some time to get there. Some of the other categories are up, aircraft, land, vehicles, electronics, common sensors, may also have a relevance for res response, but we're going to have to wait a little longer to see the full year results, see whether it's really changing demand signal, or just a matter of sequencing. And so finally, I'd like to cover a few things that are not yet covered in this data. that are a key part of response. So 20.7 billion in drawdowns. Those do not show up in FPDS as part of acquisition spending because that's transfers out of existing inventory. Likewise, Defense Production Act Title III, direct investments in capacity are not included in the FPDS data, though I do think more centralized reporting would be valuable there. Some of the investments in the organic uh, munitions base would show up if they were for the contract management thereof, but some of the big spending does not happen until this first quarter of 23. And likewise, we've seen a series of major awards, including you know, uh, 4.8 billion for Gimler's in just April, 
and that's over multiple years, and other announcements that our panelists can speak to more. So the acquisition system has now increasingly ramped up, but a lot of it took until fiscal year 23 to occur. So I look forward to hearing from our panelists and uh, some of the details about what is and is not covered here. Thank you. There we go. Uh, thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, three points I'd like both for the panel and, and the audience uh, in the room and, and online to take away from this. Number one is that's backward looking data, right? And, and backward looking data always uh, um, uh, from the perspective of where we are going forward uh, has to be filtered. Um, it's important to recognize that all of those dollars are inflation adjusted, right? So, you know, if you were, you know, uh, contract obligations in FY84 of, la of the last century, for a strategic events initiative adjusted for inflation is a much bigger number than any of us thought we were spending at that point. Similarly, even FY21 or FY20 data, when you've got an OMB uh, inflation adjustment of 7%, obviously what looks flat is actually 7% higher than it was the year before. And we deal with, you know, uh, um, then year dollars, not with constant dollars in terms of, uh, of our actual actions. Um, the second major point I'd like to note is there, there's big lag, right? Uh, all right, so we've got first quarter of FY23, but that was operating under continuing resolution, where we had a hope of what we were going to get in FY23 appropriations, but that money didn't arrive. It wasn't signed by the president until December 27th, wasn't apportioned out by OMB until late January, or early February. Uh, Tony and Matt, I don't think you guys started getting that money or seeing that money until well into February. So it's not surprising that the contract obligations from that, even under an urgent uh, uh, effort um, won't show up until uh, April or May and therefore won't be reflected until we see the third quarter data. And in DOD, we don't see the third quarter data until, um, um, pardon me, I have to tell my computer I'm not interested in installing some automatic updates in the middle of this presentation. Um, and in real time, uh, we won't see that data for another six months or more. Uh, the third point is that the, the funding itself uh, comes from multiple sources, and it really doesn't, DOD contract obligations don't really capture the entire effort. I think Dr. LaPlante uh, made a huge step in this direction. Um, yesterday's release by DOD of the Strategic and Technology Master Plan also emphasizes, and this is a big change from the past, that we're not looking to go it alone. We're really looking at a collaborative enterprise across our allies and partners, both in the Ukraine specifics and in the broader global scenario. None of these are captured in the data we just saw. They are, however, data do matter from the point of view of justifying both what we've gotten for the money we have and what we're using it for and what we need going forward, both for FY24 and beyond. And so now I'm going to come back to the original plan, uh, proposed idea, which is we know what the problem is. The problem is we're not producing enough to meet our needs. But the larger question is, what are those needs? How do we resource them? And what else do we do about them? So with that, I'm going to now turn to our panel and ask them each to make some preliminary remarks, and then we'll get into a dialogue and discussion amongst ourselves, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So uh, let me turn first uh, to Cynthia Cook. Um, Cynthia, the think tank perspective is usually what we bring into the end, but I think today, given that the data that we just showed, let me turn to you and ask for four or five minutes of, uh, of what you see the key problems are and what we might might do about them. And then I'll, then I'll go, uh, Christine McKenzie, to you. Uh, thanks, Dave. I appreciate the opportunity to go first because that way uh, I'm sure that my other brilliant panelists will be making all the same points I'd want to make. And at the end, if I, if I come last, I'll be struggling for uh, comments. Um, I want to offer sort of a, a perspective that's based on really uh, thinking about industry and why we are where we are in terms of needing to think about and uh, fund surge capacity. Dr. LaPlante's earlier remarks prove that seniors in the Pentagon are thinking not just tactically about how to surge to continue to support the uh, war, uh, uh, to support Ukraine's defense against Russia's Russia's uh, attack, um, but really this larger strategic issue relating to deterrence and to the pacing threat. So those are our two different but related problems. And one of the problems, one of the one of the things that that overlap both is really the need to understand surge and manufacturing capacity as a big picture. The challenge is that doing all of this requires a longer term focus 
Dr. LaPlante mentioned the use of multi-years, but the acquisition system, uh, given that it's uh, focused on programs, multi-year programs can fix challenges in individual systems, but may not uh, be adequate to think through the larger question of surge as a capability or capacity beyond refilling individual stocks. Uh, Dr. LaPlante's remarks were, were very uh, interesting from that perspective as he talked about the different efforts underway, and I'm hoping that the other panelists will have more detailed specifics about them because I think that that is a, an extremely important way of thinking about it. Surge uh, needs to be understood and probably funded separately to ensure that it is there when, when it's needed. Um, and I, I would say that the challenges are, of course, different from government arsenals than uh, contractor facilities. And these remarks really focus more on, on contractors than on the, on the arsenal sector. Uh, as Dr. LaPlante mentioned, the acquisition pressure for low costs combined with a really amazing revolution in manufacturing over the last few decades resulted in very efficient production lines that lack manufacturing slack. Uh, the, the caveat, one caveat with what he said is that uh, just-in-time uh, delivery is a way, uh, it may be a way of reducing um, stocks that you have to pay for in your factory, but what it really is, is a pressure for first time quality. So if you want thing, if you're gonna have just in time delivery, it has to be right with no rework or it'll stop the production line. And that's a really good thing. Advanced lean manufacturing doesn't just say deliver us what we need when we need it. It also involves working with suppliers to ensure that they have flexible manufacturing lines that can either increase or go down as needed. Uh, as, but this is all based on a market system of, you know, if you're building cars and you're building a million cars a year and you have customers, then you, you have uh, a different manufacturing challenge than you do in um, the Pentagon and in uh, defense manufacturing where this flexibility isn't really prioritized in the same way. So getting to the question of how to increase Production. I have a, a. I wrote a piece that just goes through the details of you know you need to build a new line or build a new factory and you know have a design for a factory and get insurance and et cetera et cetera et cetera. Um, uh, you need to hire train and train workers. Um, this can take three to five years. Uh, just you know think about the lead time for machine tools. Um, and that means that if you're going to build a new factory, that it's it's you have to take a long-term perspective, and that could even go beyond what's in a, a multi-year. The hope is that um, the advanced manufacturing techniques that Dr. LaPlante mentioned, digital engineering, advanced manufacturing, robotics, will mean that there is a possibility for surge, a different kind of surge where you, you can fund and, and think through how to do this more rapidly without um, building what you have, you know, duplicating what you have, try to think different and, and build new. Um, thinking about the questions that, that we need to ask going forward, the first is how are we gonna fund surge? Uh, and again, thinking about what alternatives exist. Uh, the second, uh, question is is really what those alternatives are and to put a, a focus on developing uh, and, and continuing to invest in manufacturing capabilities separately from specific programs. Uh, the final and probably the hardest questions and the one that I hear less about is that the fundamental basic reason why there are challenges with surge is that the Department of Defense has other priorities and they funded those. If DOD is going to fund surge ca capacity, what are they going to give up? Budgeting is not quite a zero-sum game. If there are urgent needs, uh, uh, more resources can be found. Congress has, has plussed up in the past. But um, over the longer term, giving money to one priority takes it away from others. So if surge is so important, is, is innovation going to be deprioritized? 
uh, so that we can we can focus on surge. I mean, what are the trades here? And this needs to be part of the conversation because if it's not, then eventually all the best efforts to invest in this flexibility and to in, increase surge capacity may just, uh, you know, in, in five and, or 10 years, if there's peace, they'll just wither away again. So that's that's uh, what I would leave for uh, Bill and others to answer. Gee, thanks. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Cynthia. I appreciate that. And I think uh, that, that last point about, uh, you know, trade space, right? Uh, you, you, you um, I believe it was almost 60 years ago now that Alan Intoven, who's one of the architects of the original PPBS process under Secretary McNamara, uh, wrote very pointedly, he says, the worst thing you can do to the military departments is take away their shortfalls because then they don't know how to how to manage. And what he meant was not that there's no capability to manage. It's that shortfalls help focus on priorities in a way that an abundance of when you have more money than you know what to do with uh, can ever do. Um, it's been a while since DOD has had the problem of more money than we knew what to do with. I don't think that day is going to return anytime soon. So uh, let me then turn now to uh, Christine McKenzie, special uh, advisor to uh, the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. For the uh, the OSD perspective, um, not only on uh, on the problem statement and what we do about it, but some of the issues perhaps that have been raised. And let me note that when we get to the end, each of you will have the opportunity to be smarter than you were when you were talking based on what others have said. I'm going to give you the opportunity to go back and ask each other a question first time out of the box. So, uh, Christine, over to you. Thank you very much, David, and I really appreciate being on the panel today. This is a, a topic that I live and breathe every day. Um, I've been involved not just in the, the past year with Ukraine and trying to figure out surge, but have been doing this kind of work for the past seven years uh, as we've had different crises and, and tried to look at how we surge uh, capacity and capability. So let me just give a little bit of background on you know how we, how we got here, uh, some of the issues that we have. I'm going to try not to duplicate uh, Dr. LaPlante's remarks, but um, you know I'm sure he's uh, covered some of the same topics. So uh, a lot of people like to talk about COVID, you know, raised awareness, uh, and the Ukraine conflict has really emphasized the fragility of supply chains. Uh, for both commercial and DoD systems, I would I would caveat that with the fact that DoD was pretty aware that we had fragile supply chains. We've been um, publishing reports for many years, uh, Executive Order thirteen eight hundred six in in twenty eighteen, et cetera. Uh, I just I think that a lot of commercial industry and especially the general public was not really aware. I, uh, I like to say that the general public didn't really understand fragility of supply chains until they couldn't get a car. Uh, so that really brought home, you know, that these things are, are something that we need to worry about. We've had decades long private sector and public policy approaches to domestic production that prioritize low short term costs over security, sustainability and resilience. Uh, the industrial base has been optimized for efficiency, not resiliency. Just-in-time deliveries, as, as Cynthia mentioned, uh, versus inventories of long lead time components, cut warehousing costs, it's the Walmart model that everybody jumped onto um, and increases efficiency, but limits flexibility and responsiveness. DOD has many, many single and sole source suppliers, often foreign suppliers, often adversarial foreign suppliers. Uh, although those sources are cheaper, they are less reliable. Uh, critical capabilities have been driven offshore due to uh, many things. A lot of times it's a demand issue. DOD is a very small customer in some of these uh, sectors. And so that introduces risk uh, for global some of these global supply chains. A couple of examples, rare earth elements. Uh, U.S. was the world leader until the 1980s. Now China controls 85% of that market. Semiconductors, uh, U.S. production has fallen from about 40% to 10% in the last 10 years. Um, but recent executive orders like Executive Order 14017, America's Supply Chains, and legislation like the CHIPS Act are trying to uh, aimed at addressing these issues. As far as did flexibility and surge capability go, uh, we really lack the flexibility and surge capability in the industrial base for many of the systems that we produce. This affects readiness and mobilization, um, and it's similar for allied production. I, I'm sure Dr. LaPlante mentioned the National Armaments Directors uh, group that he stood up under the uh, Ukraine Defense Contract Group that the Secretary has. 
And we looked at worldwide production for things like 155 millimeter ammunition. And across the board, industries in those countries face the same exact issues that we do. So this is not unique to, to uh, the United States. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has really brought into sharp focus the importance of being able to surge, uh, as well as the challenges in, in doing so. Over the time, DOD is really, and the industrial base have really uh, prioritized, again, efficiency over resiliency. Production lines have gone cold, things sting our missile production. Uh, parts have become obsolete. Sub-tier suppliers have consolidated or businesses have gone out of business entirely. Uh, industry right-sizes itself to DOD demand. They don't have extra surge capability because we don't pay them to do that. They're also reluctant, rightly so, to build additional capability at risk until they have a clear, consistent demand signal or a business case from DOD. Uh, industry needs to see some degree of confidence that if they invest, there's going to be a good chance they will get something for in their investment. So things like sustained production. And we typically can't give them, promise them that, especially with our one-year uh, funding cycles. Um, additionally, no one really anticipated the prolonged high volume conflict that we're seeing in Ukraine. Uh, the U.S. has donated over uh, one and a half billion, excuse me, million rounds of 155 ammunition, and Ukraine shoots thousands of those rounds a day. Global industry cannot keep up with the level of demand, as David mentioned earlier. In times of crisis, uh, such as the Ukraine conflict, DOD attempts to surge uh, to meet requirements, but we face many constraints. Cynthia mentioned, and, and this is an important point because there's not realization, even at the highest level sometimes of leadership, that increasing capacity can take months or even years, and deliveries at that increased capacity come years afterwards um, those due to production lead times. After the crisis ends, DOD often has not maintained that increased capacity. So when the next conflict or crisis comes, we often pay to reconstitute the capability. <clears throat> so that's all the bad news. <laughs> the good news is that at the start of the Ukraine conflict, and I'm sure Dr. LaPlant mentioned this, ANS revived, revived a specialized team of munitions and industrial-based experts that perform quick deep dives into the supply chain to determine ways to speed up replenishment. I have led that team for the past uh, seven years, uh, including the past year for Ukraine. Some of the main constraints that we identified, and, and David mentioned these some of his, in his opening remarks, insufficient capacity, obviously that's uh, that's an obvious one. Shared sub-tier suppliers. People don't understand that um, a lot of the sub-tier suppliers for these systems are shared between systems, and so you cannot surge multiple systems at the same time because there's just not enough capacity. One of the main constraints with surging Ukraine munitions has been precision ball bearings, believe it or not. Many, many systems use those and things like uh, guidance systems and there's not enough capacity as we're surging all these systems simultaneously. Workforce, obviously, across the board has been a constraint that we see. Uh, attrition of workforce doubled during COVID. We're starting to see that come back uh, to a certain extent. But we also face issues because plants that build these um, munitions are in undesirable locations many times, purposely. You don't want them to be in very populous areas um, just because of the safety factor. Uh, and young people are really... Uh, want to do innovative work and sometimes just you know putting a widget in a in a thing every day on the factory line is, is not really so um, exciting to them. So obsolescence plagues the department and especially when we try to surge uh, we field systems for a long time and we are not doing technology refreshes as, as often as we need to. Long lead times um, again that's one of the main constraints we see. Uh, the team has worked with the services and industry to help accelerate production of munitions. We've gotten two and a half billion dollars worth of funding to do that to date. Uh, Congress is helping with that uh, because they are appropriating replenishment funds for Ukraine, uh, which is going to both the services and to the DPA Title III uh, account that someone mentioned earlier. Um, so we're able to use that funding to increase capacity. And then the multi-years, which has been mentioned uh, multiple times here. Unfortunately, that was an authorization, not an appropriation, uh, but DOD is still moving out on multiple systems within the FY23 and 24 timeframe. Really, 
I think the best news is that if DOD, Congress, and industry work together, we can really move mountains. Uh, we've shown it during the Ukraine conflict. We've been mobilizing the defense industrial base in a way we haven't since World War II. We are building a resilient supply chain, both with domestic capability and international cooperation. Allies and partners are a key part of this. We cannot do all of this by ourselves. We've been increasing production capacity many fold in much shorter times than would normally be required. We've been using uh, different types of contracting actions. OTAs were mentioned earlier, but things like UCAS on definitized contract actions where you can do a not to exceed contract initially to get started and then definitize later. Uh, and then fielding systems that uh, are either new or used in innovative ways. So we uh, put together a lot of different systems, take a radar system from this one and a launcher from this one and a missile from this one and putting them together and fielding those rapidly. So that's really uh, been helpful. DOD and industry should really look towards operating this way as a normal course of action, not just when we're in a crisis. It would really increase our responsiveness in the future. Uh, thank you for the time. All right, thanks, Christine. I appreciate that. Uh, it's a good perspective as well. Um, but all of those uh, comments from both uh, uh, Christ uh, Christine and, and from Cynthia um, sort of are, are theoretical when it comes to actually implementing it through contract, uh, which is what uh, the uh, joint PAO uh, for armaments and ammunition has been doing over the last X number of, uh, of actually decades, but most recently under this. Um, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, you go back to the Cold War, we actually had a pretty well-defined scenario against which we could calculate what our surge capacity requirements would be. Um, you know, uh, now, now you're faced with a very different reality, and Dr. LaPlante emphasized the importance of requirements at the front end of this. Uh, Matt and Tony, you know, we, we have this odd situation in Ukraine, and I'm, you know, I'm a bit of an amateur on this sort of thing, but it looks to me like we've got an interesting combination of World War I uh, with uh, early 21st century uh, um, uh, um, uh, intelligence and, uh, you know, second decade 21st century innovation and a bunch of MacGyvering going on in between uh, all of that. And I don't know how you translate that into any kind of coherent requirements that matter beyond Ukraine, which is really part of what the challenge we have faced. Um, how do you guys see the problem and what have you been trying to do about it? And I'm, I'm going to turn to both of you as a tag team. You may not be sitting in the same room, but I'm sure you had at least a chance to collaborate with one another before you came on here. Yeah, thank you, David. We're actually sitting right across from each other. Do we both have? We okay, mine's off. Yeah. Uh, anyway, good morning. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, David, you mentioned that I'm now a PO soldier. Uh, what, what you didn't mention is that since I left JPO Armaments and Ammunition last summer up until really just now, I've been up at ASALT uh, working as the Assistant Deputy for Acquisition and System Management, uh, working very closely with Dr. McKenzie and several others in the building really focused focused almost exclusively on ramping up our munitions production capacity uh, to, to meet the demand in Ukraine. Uh, the last point you made there really got right at the crux of uh, what I was going to talk about, which was how do we determine how much inventory and how much production capacity ma to maintain when it comes to munitions. Um, I, I would say there's two really two main components to that. One is what we call the total munitions requirement. Every year we go through an exercise in the Army where we model uh, across all of our munitions, what that requirement would be for war stock, training, and test requirements. Uh, that informs our budgeting process. Um, that, however, is resource constrained. So we never, uh, I, I would argue, in, in, you know, every year we look and we determine where we're going to take risk across that portfolio of munitions. On the TMR, I would also say that we model against assumptions on how we will fight. Uh, the fight that we're supplying right now is a very different fight than we would fight. You, I, you know, you could argue it's, it's not a, the combined arms fight that we would have uh, with, with the Air Force, with our deep assets, uh, taking the burden off of what is largely an, an artillery fight that you see in Ukraine. Uh, so that has um, really, we, we're supplying something that we were, were not built to, uh, to supply. Uh, so that's been a particular challenge as the demand has far outstripped our, our production capacity as uh, both Christine and, and Dr. McKenzie have, uh, have mentioned. So what are we doing about it? Um, first of all, we are investing heav heavily to increase our production capacity. Probably no surprise, the guided multiple launch rocket system rockets, 155 artillery, uh, Javelin, those are the three big, you know, three of the big areas that we're investing. We're also investing in, uh, in, in PAC-3 production uh, and other things as well. 
Um, that's going to take time to build up, uh, really two to three years to see that capacity really come to bear, even though uh, we're, we're taking advantage of uh, special contracting authorities, uh, working with uh, the uh, industrial base policy team up at OSD to, uh, to move quickly and move our orders to the top of the queue out there in commercial industry to make things happen uh, quickly. Uh, and so in that meantime, as we uh, provide munitions out of our own stockpile, we're also leveraging foreign sources, really uh, looking across the world, wherever production capacity or existing stockpiles are available. Uh, we're taking advantage of Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative funding to go out and buy that capacity. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of those foreign deliveries flowing into Ukraine. So that's been very helpful in the near term. Uh, over the long term, however, uh, our concern is how do we maintain this capacity that we're building? The capacity that we're building, one of the big questions we've had is, what is the level that we build to? How many projectiles per month is the right level? Um, we're building to, to meet what we think is the current demand. However, we know in the long term that demand is going to go down. So our concern is how do we how do we maintain that capacity or that right capacity over time? So I think the, the, the key questions for the Army, at least going forward, is you know, what is that right total munitions requirement for us to build to and to resource to? And the second part of that is how, how do we make those trades uh, to find those resources uh, to meet what are going to be higher minimum sustaining rates for this production capacity so that we don't find ourselves right back in the same situation here in a few years? So I'll pause there and, uh, and hand it over to, uh, to Matt to talk about uh, what we're doing from the JPO armaments and ammunition perspective. Great, thanks, Colonel Gibson, and then uh, it's great to be here. And I think Dr. McKenzie hit on very, uh, very important elements of what's going on. And I have very little to say after Chris talked it all, but <laughs> but I will add a few things because we got Mr. Grinwald there, and um, the the PEO, uh, the Army, we are the DoD single manager for conventional ammo, and I just really want to hit on you know what, how did we get here, and. That was created in, in order to increase effectiveness and efficiencies for buying munitions for all the services. We were in a downward trend in requirements. What can we do to be more efficient? Uh, Mr. Greenwald uh, pushed through some legislation in the late 90s called um, Public Law 105-261, Section 806, Procurement of Ammunition. I think he'll remember that. Uh, and what that does is gives the single manager for conventional ammo the authority to restrict procurements to suppliers within U.S. and Canada at the time in order to maintain them for industrial mobilization or national emergencies. All about, you know, keep these, these companies alive and well. And, and that just brings on, you know, the policy within DOD was to focus on minimum sustaining rate. Let's keep those key suppliers uh, in, in business. Uh, Dr. McKenzie talked about you know, the single point failures are limited sources of supply. We have over 300 of those. We've been really focused on sustaining those critical capabilities, and she hit on the, the fragility of it all. Um, regarding the organic industrial base, the Army ammunition plants, we've been investing in them heavily over the years to avoid catastrophic failures. Yeah, we, did, we have some um, facilities. They're the only source of explosives uh, in North America, the only source of nitrogen cellulose that goes in propellants in North America. So we've been investing in order to avoid catastrophic failures, but we've also been investing to establish uh, new capabilities. Uh, so given this the situation in Ukraine and, and, and surge, you know, but produce as much as we can, um, th there's various definitions of surge. And if you look at DOD policy, you'll see a sentence that says surge is an increase in production for a limited amount of time. Okay, so, you know, so it's very broad, and so we really have to get down into the details when we talk about artillery mellow parts, when we talk about explosives, we talk about propellants, we talk about low to symbol impact of artillery rounds. Um, we, you know, small cal ammo hasn't been much of a factor in that, and, and that's another bear altogether, but it's a good bear because there's a commercial market for small cal ammo to help sustain it when requirements go down. But with this ramp up in, in, in needs for you for artillery in Ukraine, we've taken a, a three-pronged approach within the Army and, and the PO, and, and one is to expand the or organic industrial base for metal parts, the 155, and, and that's Scranton Army ammunition plant that's in eastern Pennsylvania. 
We're, we've been producing in the order of 14,000, 20,000 a month of these projectiles. And uh, we have uh, received a uh, Ukraine supplemental, uh, some tranche funding, and we're going to expand that up beyond 85,000 uh, a month. Uh, that does take time. We talked about long lead items and, and some of the long lead items regarding metal manufacturing are, are the high tonnage presses. They could take 18 months, two years to produce. And fortunately, through OSD's assistance and some DPAS ratings, we're able to accelerate that. But that is a, a, a long lead item. Um, so organic base, and that includes uh, the, the explosives and, and, and propellants. And then we're expanding a Lotus symbol and pack. We have a big facility in Iowa. Uh, Burlington, Iowa. That's our artillery Lotus Simulant Pack. We're building an $800 million new facility to dramatically increase the ability to um, um, produce the artillery rounds with uh, the latest explosives. So we look forward to that, that fruit being born in the next uh, few years on that one. Next is we're expanding commercial capacity. So we're working with, the, say, the general dynamics uh, of the world and expanding what's available in, in their facilities and even building a new factory. Uh, we talked about that earlier. And yes, we are building a new factory and we're doing it in the fastest way I, I I can't even believe how fast we're going to be able to do this. Uh, it's through leveraging some, some expertise across the globe, and we will have a new facility in place by the middle of uh, 2024, uh, if not, not sooner. We're also leveraging a commercial capability up in Canada. Uh, that's part of the North um, uh, American technology industrial base, so we'll be expanding artillery metal parts there. Uh, and, then the, and, and then for Lotus Simple and Pack uh, in the commercial industry, we're putting in new lap down in Camden, Arkansas, a new Lotus Symbol and Pack plant in Kansas, uh, Parsons, Kansas, what used to be an army ammunition plant. So we really are leaning forward on, on expanding the production capacity. Lastly, it's leveraging our foreign supply base, not just NATO, but non-NATO, and we're buying as much artillery as we can and delivering it uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and, and that's been a very, very successful endeavor uh, and, and it's been stressful at times for the PMs, but they they really are, are doing a, a bang up job. So those are the, the three key prongs, the organic base, the commercial base expansion, then foreign sources to help us. Um, but so what, what do we do? Uh, down the road when the requirements tank. And we talked about you know, the surge and, and you know, the boom or bust you might hear. So uh, when the, the requirements go down, we have all this added capacity out there. We do have a, a procurement of ammunition army program. That's what funds all ammo plants uh, primarily. And, and so we can maintain uh, the equipment at these various locations. Um, and, and so I think we're, we're good there. And then we can maintain them in, in the laid away state and then bring them out uh, in a relatively um, quick fashion if need be when the blue goes up again. But the big challenge is the workforce. How do we get the workforce? And you heard Dr. McKenzie talk about some of these locations are in, in not the most desirable locations. And, and you have millennials who, you know, they'd rather work across the street at Amazon in an air-conditioned warehouse versus this harsh, you know, uh, forging outfit with the uh, heat just burning their eyebrows, you know. So it's it's really a challenge. And then we have locations, in, as I said, in Kansas and Iowa. So it's tough to get the skill sets to be there for that second shift, that third shift, which is really what how we're focusing in on surge. It's Maintaining the skill sets for, for one shift is really what we strive to do, what we plan out with our requirements. And then Surge will be adding that second shift and then third shift. That, that's, that's typically it now. When we're dealing with acid plants, it, 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 you, you can't do that. They're 24 seven pretty much uh, in operation, not necessarily moving product, but um, that's, that's uh, I guess that's, that's my perspective on, on what's going on. So I'll pass it back to you, David, over. Uh, thanks, Sue. Um, I'm often reminded what my mother would have given to have a mute button on me when I was young, but that's not here uh, or there. Uh, yeah, that's a great summary. And particularly, I like your point about what goes up comes down, right? And so there's really a, a, a very tough dynamic there. Uh, Bill, I originally uh, tagged you to talk about it a little bit from your background perspective, but I think there's a bigger question that I'd like to pose to you now. And I, I know you're going to react to this in a positive way when I change directions on you at the last minute. Um, but 
<laughs> but the the, uh, the 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 financial side of this is really, I think, uh, uh, one of the real linchpins. In you know, we we've already have a cycle in terms of our budget process that um, you know the kinds of timetables we've been talking about this morning uh, are dwarfed by how long it takes to get the money, get the requirement in place, put the money in the out years of the FIDIP, keep it in there through the process until you get to the budget year, get it through OMB, get it through OSD, get it through the appropriations and authorization committees, and then begin to obligate the funds, right? So that's item number one. If I go back to the Cold War, where we actually, in my experience, did have the ability to both define what our search capacity requirements would be and talk to industry about how they would invest their own money in this, you, you first of all, you have a trouble finding transcripts of earning calls from many of those companies. And a lot of those companies were privately held, not publicly traded in those days. There was a much greater ability and probably willingness of industry to invest where there was minimum return for a bunch of good national security and patriotic reasons. That seems to me to be a little less the case these days where you know the demands of the investment community is not about patience and patriotism. It's about returns this quarter. And I see it in the earnings calls of all the publicly traded companies. I also see it in the actions of the privately held companies, which probably have at least as much financial pressure on them now as the publicly traded ones do in almost direct contradiction to what it was back in the 1970s and 1980s. What's it look like from the investor side of this? And does any of this make sense, both for the near term and the long run? Okay, no, I happy to happy to switch to that that point. Um, you know, it's 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 one of those things where uh, you have to look at is the investment community actually any different? Uh, and if you look in the Cold War, they were looking at an economy where defense was over ten percent of GDP. Okay, so that made a big deal to the financial community. Defense manufacturing is not even close to that today. And so that's why I think we have a, you know, we're going to have a financial problem. And, and I also have to kind of look at, you know, finance is not dumb. And, and they've seen the cyclical uh, game that has, has over, that has taken over and over, except for that one period of post-World War II, just, you know, but even, even until about 1960s, 1970s, that was a little different. But we have a, had, had a historical cyclical a uh, 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 systematic issue in the regards that we build up and then we build down. Yeah. And, and that's been happening since the war of 1812 in every conflict we've had. And then all of a sudden we're surprised when the conflict happens that it takes 18 to 24 to 36 months to ramp back up. And that's occurred in every conflict we've had except perhaps in the, in, in, in the Cold War. And so finance looks at this and, 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 and says, well, wait a minute. So we have a problem here. Somebody's going to pay to ramp up. And then who's going to be left with the bag uh, when we ramp down again? And, and I think that's, that, that's, that's kind of where we're at right now is, is who's going to make that investment? And, and do we really have the, the capability and the will to maintain the level uh, of, of capacity we want. I mean, really when it gets down to it is we do a terrible job as a nation of wanting to buy insurance, okay? And this is all about insurance. And, 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 and so, you know, you, who's, who's to blame for that? Well, you know, I mean, look at our overseers, our comptrollers, our appropriators, and, and so on. And, you know, if, 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 I, if I treated my personal life insurance issue the way we treat insurance for national defense, it would be, oh, you didn't die this year. So therefore, that must be a waste of money that you paid for your insurance. Well, that's the way our oversight community looks at the situation. And so we don't invest. And then we come into this issue right now. So going back to the fi finance, finance sees this. And right now they're looking at, this is not 10% of GDP. The returns are probably only going to be for a few years. Uh, and, uh, you know, why should we make that investment when we're going to end up as the loser because the government can't commit to the level of defense spending that it needs to uh, in, in these areas? So I'll, I'll stop there. I hope that answers that question and you can ask some more. Dave. 
Bill, that's a that's a great point. I'm doing a little math in my head here, right? We have roughly a $30 trillion economy. Um, going back to Greg's slides at the beginning here, we had $400 billion in FY22 dollars of contract obligations, not outlays, but obligations uh, in FY22. Uh, I believe that $400 billion divided by $31 trillion is uh, barely over one and a third percent. Right. Am I doing the math right there, Cynthia, in my head? Um, but, uh, uh, you know, your point about, OK, that's not going to drive the economy. It's not going to drive the investment community. That's a really key point. Look, we've got about 10 minutes left. And, and my original plan was we would go around the table here one more time. But, Bob, I think I'd like to open it up to questions from uh, that are coming in from the uh, from the registrants and the participants, both in the room and in person. And then I'll alert each of the panel members. I'm going to come back to you with one minute at the end. And your one minute should be, OK, you've got one minute with the president and with the secretary of defense and with the chairs of all the relevant committees. What do you recommend? And they do. Do you be thinking about that while we're answering the questions? Uh, Bob, do you have a few questions to throw up here? I have more if you have none, but I'm hoping you've got a few. Yes, David, I have one right now uh, ready to go. And so uh, this is uh, from the uh, in-person uh, attendance. Uh, what role could government depots and arsenals play in complementing private industry capacity and capability to ensure we maintain strategic surge um, capabilities? Well, I'm going to I'm going to first call on Matt because he mentioned that in his comments, and then Bill, you may want to comment on that as well because you've been in the middle. Of, you know, I, I I've been at war with the depot the depot caucus for about forty years, so I'm not going to make any comment on it. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll hit on the production plants, uh, not necessarily the hard iron yeah. uh, depots, but, but for the ammo plants, we invest typically invest in capabilities that industry is not willing to invest in. Invest in the uh, the capability and the capacity. That's typically what we do. And that's how we complement um, industry, particularly when we're dealing with the uh, with explode energetic materials and the environmental permitting uh, that's required. And so that that's how we complement. We do those more riskier elements um, in the ammo plants than say uh, in, in the volume in particular than say in industry. Over. That's a good point. All right, Bill, you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, the the obviously these these the ammunition plants and 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 uh, uh, organic depots are are, are important to the situation. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we we, we attempted to you know in, as, in, in Congress to to uh, to continue keep that investment going. Uh, the issue is the same thing. We've we've done minimal insurance policies for these. We've did, uh, we we haven't spent the money to maintain the level we had. We have a minimum capacity. But now we need more, and that's going to require uh, additional resources and so on. But it's the same problem we have in the private sector. You need resources. You need on the private sector. You need DPA Title III funds. In the ammunition and plants uh, area, we're going to need to 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 uh, really gear up production and so on. And then we need to have those long term commitments to keep uh, uh, the investments going. So it's, it's but but th th this is a joint uh, effort. Uh, and 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 I think uh, both uh, sectors of the uh, the industrial base uh, are, need to come uh, to the table and 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 be a part of the solution. It's interesting from a historical perspective, and Bill, you mentioned post World War II. You go back and you look at the archives of both the War Department and the Navy Department. Of course, we didn't have a Defense Department in, until 1947 or 1949, depending on how you define it. Um, and and there was a very strong motivation there that says we have to keep the organic capacity because that will give us the ability to respond while industry is building up the surge capacity that we had seen historically get built up at the beginning of World War II, at the beginning of World War One, and it, all the way back even even to the Civil War. We're now at a point where there is. In, from my perspective, very little surge capacity and the ability to turn something on right away in the depots in the organic side, right? Um, there, I mean, I, I'm a couple of years out of date here, but uh, Matt, Tony, tell me if it looks differently or, or Christine. Um, you know, most of our organic uh, facilities across DOD, whether it's shipyards or, or uh, you know, uh, Army Material Command or, or uh, Air Force uh, uh, Logistics Centers, are operating pretty darn near full capacity with what their physical capability and their workforce will handle right now, right? And and so there's not a lot of surge capacity there as either. I think this is an under uh, appreciated and understudied element of this. But uh, Bob, uh, a second question that you might have, and if not, uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, begin to close it out here. Yeah, second question here is 
DOD can't seem to maintain, as many of the panelists have mentioned, their organizational memory to, re to uh, retain these long-term investments. So how does the DOD and Congress retain lessons learned and keep long-term investments uh, that are critical? I'm going to make one opening comment on that. So, you know, I've been, Bill talked about this, the increases and the decreases, and I've been through quite a number of them now. And, and of course, they do feel that way. Every single O10 who is dealing with the last time we cut too much and had to rebuild it back up is learning lessons they learned as an O5 at that point. That's kind of the cycle time that goes through here, right? And so you don't have anybody who has had an experience outside of that cycle. That's a big piece of it. But let me turn to our, our panelists and uh, see if anybody else has more they'd like to offer in response to that. Christine, you want to say something first? Because I think you sit where you can influence that better than the rest of us can. Yeah, I thank you. I, I, I would say that... Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of my, my opening remarks, I think that we are in a different place right now. I've, see, I've seen this happen over and over and over again. I've been up in OSD for 10 years and I've been in charge of this whole surge capacity thing for that time. So I, we've seen this over and over again. We've seen the institutional memory go away. Uh, but I think that it's different this time. And I, I, I'm hopeful, I always say, uh, uh, cross your fingers, but don't hold your breath. I'm hopeful that we have a uh, longer term uh, understanding of the fragility of the supply chains because it's not just DOD that understands that now. Commercial industry has a better understanding because of the the straits they were put in during COVID and the public has a better understanding. So as we cycle people back through DOD from the commercial industry, from outside in the public sector, they're coming in with this better starting realization about supply chain fragility. I think Congress also has a better understanding uh, of some of the things that they can do to help us mitigate that. So I think we're in a slightly different time. I'm just hoping it lasts. Uh, that's not a bad place to uh, to end up on here. Let me begin to close hey, well, out. By, let me yeah, just ahead, jump in sure. with one comment, which is that um, going beyond what we are actually trying to do to increase surge capacity right now or develop surge capacity, we could really be thinking about what are the lessons learned from this surge, capturing them uh, and figuring out how we did it so that we have more of a, a playbook next time there's there's we need to engage with this. And I think um, that's uh, where yeah, the, it's ahead. so important that the academic community does that. Yeah. And that's yeah. what's so important about uh, the Naval Postgraduate School could actually, uh, if they do some of those, those type of case studies. Bill, you're stealing my closing remarks because I think in the last uh, 65 minutes, we have probably touched on 30 or 40 research topics that I would commend uh, to Dave Lewis and Bob to uh, to pursue through the, the, the PG school and elsewhere. Let me just make one comment. Uh, you know, I've probably gotten 10 times more criticism for buying too much of something than I have for buying too little of something. And I think one of the missing elements that hasn't come up at all is there has got to be political support from the top for people who will actually go out on a limb and say, okay, you want search capacity? We're going to invest in search capacity. Don't in my career when I end up buying too much of something. So uh, um, it, now let me uh, then, you know, so you, you pick it. You've got the secretary, you've got the president, you've got the uh, the big four on the Hill. Um, what do you recommend to them? One minute, uh, I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Cynthia, and then uh, Christine. I would uh, just remind them that if they increase investments in uh, surge and defense manufacturing more broadly, that in the, in the past there have been shown to be uh, positive spin-offs for the broader manufacturing industrial base. So increasing surge capacity and building up defense manufacturing is, is not just about defense. It's about the broader economy. All right. Not a zero-sum game. Christine, and then I'll go to, to the Army. Yes, I think uh, that we understand the issues, we understand the cause of the issues and the options for mitigating them. Capturing the lessons learned is a really big part, part of this, so I'm glad that came up. I think establishing that permanent um, entity within uh, uh, OSD ANS is going to help with that so that capability doesn't uh, go away. We have momentum for operating in a different way that makes the DIV healthier and more resilient for instance, multi-year procurements. So we need to make sure that we don't have that short-term memory that when the crisis is over, we go back to our old ways. All right, thank you. Uh, Matt and Tony? 
Uh, I'll just say I echo whatever Mr. Bush, the Army Acquisition Executive, says to Congress. Over. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the, yeah, I think the, what I would add what is. Sorry about that. The importance of a, a steady demand signal. And David, you mentioned that you know it'd be in an, really about a 20 year cycle. I think it's more of a five year cycle that we see the uh, the ups and downs of uh, of investment in munitions. Uh, munitions have typically been the bill payer for modernization or for readiness as uh, the overall uh, defense budget has gone up and, and gone down. Uh, so that I think would help give that uh, steady signal to industry and incentivize them to invest, which you know has been a challenge as we uh, ramp up production. And Bill, uh, last uh, you 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 got all the guys that you've wanted to tell what to do for a long time. What do you tell them? I, I would say uh, they need top cover for all those authorities that some staff member wrote who was wasn't really part of the problem was actually trying to fix the problem. And that's uh, MTAs, OTA production authorities, DPA Title III, uh, multi-year, all these things you have the authorities, but you need to give the top cover to the, to the individuals who are actually trying to execute this. Uh, then I would say there's only one difference between this problem and past problems, and that's that our, our overall commercial civilian manufacturing base is hollowed out. And what that means is we're going to have to work closer with our allies and, and figure out how to, to uh, increase production there. And what that means is ITAR reform. And if we can't do ITAR reform, we're not gonna have the ability to work with them. And so that is another top-down issue that the president and his senior advisors need to deal with. All right, that's the 41st research topic here. Let me give my panel one homework assignment and then we'll close it out. Um, while this is fresh in your mind, I ask each of you to say, we're back here a year from now. Right, and we're having the same conversation. What has changed that you didn't see coming? So give me one paragraph on that. You can write it down tonight or this afternoon or tomorrow morning or while you're uh, um, um, eating lunch and uh, send me what you think a year from now will have changed uh, uh, when we when we reconvene this panel uh, in Monterey at the 21st uh, Acquisition Research Symposium. Um, with that, uh, I, I wanna thank uh, the Navy Post Graduate School for doing this. I wanna in particular make an, an honorary in memory of, uh, of Admiral Jim Green, uh, without whom none of this would be happening today or wouldn't have happened anywhere in the past. We lost him this past year. What a great loss to America and, and to the world. Um, and I wanna acknowledge his contribution and his presence here today, even though he's not on the screen with us. And I wanna thank our panel members for joining us. I wanna thank the registrants in the audience, both in the room and, uh, and around the world. Thank you all very, very much. With that, we're adjourned. You.